So this is a season that we're in right now where so many hard things are happening. Again, whether it's politics, the church, maybe your local city, maybe natural disasters, maybe in whatever community, just the entertainment industry, whatever it is, there's so much crazy right now. And we gotta talk about being a discerner because being a discerner, you have like high definition vision in a standard definition world. You see things other people don't see. You see the good, you see the bad. God opens your eyes to even see the downright bizarre. And it's like being able to see the Wi-Fi signals. It's like looking at everything that's going on that affects everything and everyone, but not everyone else sees it. Welcome to the Sean Bowles Show. And today on the show, we're going to be talking about the bridge collapse in Baltimore, Maryland. I don't know if you know this, but Redacted Online, as well as several other news sources, have broken a story that it's a cyber attack. Then we're going to be switching gears and talking about an actor who's probably one of the biggest up and comers in Hollywood is using his platform for God. We've talked about it before, but there's some new information and in an interview I'm going to show you from Alan Richson, aka Reacher. For those of you who are Reacher fans, I love Alan. Finally, besides the news you need to know, I have a word for those of you who are discerners. It's been a crazy time in politics and weather phenomenons and the church and everywhere. And many of you are discerners. You need like a, you need a guide, a field guide on how to weather the troubles of this year. That's already been really hard. And I'm going to give you a prophetic perspective about how to do just that if you're a discerner. Before we get there, we have our sponsor, Birch Gold, who helps you to learn how to diversify your retirement into Commodities like gold. Gold is at the strongest it's ever been. And are you election proof in your finances right now? Well, Birch Gold can help you become election or recession proof with your 401k, your Roth IRA, or any of your retirement needs. And you can get a free guide right now by going to uh, birchgold.com forward slash Sean Bowles, B O L Z. And it's going to help you get your free, absolutely free guide that will tell you how to do it, whether you use Birch Gold to do it or not. You're going to get a great guide that's going to give you some really good information on how to do just that. Well, let's start out with our first story. Well, the bridge attack was a cyber attack. The truth has been revealed, and there's more cyber attacks coming, according to the FBI. Now, they, the FBI has not confirmed that it's a cyber attack, but I want to watch this from Redacted, who put together an incredible... I mean, the, Redacted does a great job of reporting things that the mainstream news media is not reporting with just pinpoint accuracy. So let's watch this together. Well, the cargo ship that struck the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore was most certainly caused by a cyber attack. Excellent journalist Laura Logan confirmed that last week, speaking to her intelligence sources, both inside the Biden administration, who are currently there still working, and outside the Biden administration confirming this. This was a cyber attack. Like, Do you guys know that this was a cyber attack? That's what a lot of people don't know. When you're watching the video, for those of you who aren't listening, but you're watching, you're watching the power go off. You're watching none of the boats that helped them and service them. Like in Oklahoma, this has almost happened recently again, a couple, I think it was a week later. And there was boats that kept the, the cyber attack from launching because even though the, um, the barge, uh, the lights, the power went out and it was heading towards like a structure of a bridge, they were able to steer it away. But this particular boat didn't have those other boats around it and its power went out and its lights went out and it steered right into it. And they're calling it a cyber attack. And now we're learning that the shipping company that owns the ship just filed a court document, a legal petition, saying we had nothing to do with this. Investigative journalist Laura Logan is the great journalist who broke the cyber attack story initially, and we're thrilled to have her here on Redacted. They are stating in very clear terms that they are not in any way responsible. So if it comes to questions of, you know, maintenance, was the ship's gear up to standard? You know, was there um, an error from the captain or the crew? They're, they're telling you in legal terms that none of that is true according to them. So it's business as usual, and yet no one's made a statement yet officially from the government out loud to say this was a cyber attack, even though the director of the FBI just several months ago was saying we're about to have cyber attacks on our infrastructure. And he's even mentioned it could be boats or it could be our, our shipping ports. It could be power grids. It could be water grids. It could be all these things. And the first time it happens, it's like, I feel like our administration is hiding it or not trying to get the information for you because they're not allowing mass panic in an election year. Now we, you know, as a journalist, I'm always conscious of what I don't know. And we really don't have any, we, I have not spoken to the owners of the ship. You know, I have not talked to the company. I'm not in contact with their lawyers. So I'm not going to speculate or try to guess what's in their minds. We can go by what they have filed, that's significant. But what I will tell you here, Clayton, is in this kind of situation, we have the, the you know, we have two strong, well, four very strong indicators that are abnormal. One is that the, you know, this company has filed this very definitive statement in a court of law. 
right? So it's not just something that they're spinning to the media. They're willing to go on record in a, in a legal forum. So that adds some weight to it. Then you have the fact that we haven't heard from any of them. I mean, normally in a situation like this, especially with something as big as the strategic port of Baltimore, the biggest strategic port on the Eastern Seaboard, one of the most important hazardous materials corridors in the United States of America. I mean, really a critical linchpin of the Baltimore economy and something that is going to impact people for years to come, right? And people are going to feel it at the gas pump, at you know, in the grocery store and all across industry. Yeah, do you realize that there's um, close to 80,000 ships that, you know, drop their goods there every every day or every every week you know so there's so many ships that come through there every week and when you think about that and how much can't happen right now this is what uh some people have said that you know there's the term dark swan event which is a non-war wartime activity it's something that happens to to break down our economy quickly so that when there is war activity we don't have the substantial strength to be able to mine that war to be able to man that war this is going to have a massive impact on people's lives now, it may not be a catastrophic impact that you sense, you know, overnight, but it is nevertheless um, of such significant strategic significance that it's very odd that you see this being downplayed and minimized, right? So that raises another question. Then when you see a, a very, very quickly the uh, people like the FBI come out and say definitively, this is not a cyber attack, you know, when you haven't had time to investigate it, and also if you know anything at all about cyber attacks, right, these are the most difficult attacks in a sense to prove because they're invisible. You can't see this happening. And, um, and also, as you know, like, you know, sometimes my daughter will call me from her bedroom in the same house. Well, that phone call, you know, as your audience I'm sure knows, you know, it didn't go straight from her bedroom to my bedroom. It went to a tower somewhere, went to another tower and another tower. And at the base of every tower is a server. And these things ping all over the world. Well, you, you know, it's very difficult to trace when, when a, a signal, a GPS signal is spoofed. When somebody else takes on really, you know, takes over that signal and is feeding inputs into it that, uh, that, that deceive and mask its true path so that the people on board the ship are looking at it they say oh the ship's on course but it's the middle of the night and they're looking out maybe some somebody on the crew is looking out and they're a little bit confused because it doesn't quite look like they're in exactly the right spot but they look again at the gps oh it says we're on course these are this is this is something very easy to identify you can see when it's happening if you know what you're talking about if you work in intelligence or cyber attacks or counterintelligence or you know, or for the the CIA, many other uh, places across our government where we have qualified people who know what they're looking at. Um, but when you now get into the investigative process and you now have to find that footprint, good luck, right? It's the exact same thing. You know, I, I laugh at the people who say, "Oh, this this crazy journalist is now linking this to the voting machines." The point is that if you can't see inside those machines and you don't read code you have no chance of knowing what to happen and if you you know it's very easy for programmers to write code that masks what they did that hit it so really with cyber this is an invisible crime i will say this when she's talking about all this it's it's interesting that fbi came out with a statement within two days saying it wasn't cyber attack they haven't retracted that but there's other groups in the department of justice that have leaked some information there's been some people in the biden administration who have said we're looking at a cyber attack now no one said it completely publicly. There's just three news sources that have said it publicly based on information they're getting from behind the scenes. But what I think is wild is that the FBI warned us first. They said this is going to be happening. And then something that looks like a cyber attack is happening. And instead of investigating it, they're quickly responding without an investigation. Biden within 12 hours was saying, we're going to pay for this. Don't worry, Maryland. Don't worry, Baltimore. We're going to pay for this. The problem with that is that you have you have uh, an administration saying we're going to pay for it, which means we, the people, are going to pay for this big mistake that the shipping company is not claiming, that America is not claiming, that it's just an accident, but it's a bizarre accident. And when it actually points to cyber crime and cyber terrorism, which we can hold someone responsible for. So there's a lot on the line here. And, and so that's another red flag. When you have something like an invisible crime and you have investigators who haven't even investigated coming out being definitive, that is abnormal right that's not what normally happens in these situations and then the fourth thing that's a big red flag for me it's very easy 
And for anyone with half a brain, anyone who's a decent journalist can talk to any number of people across industry, across the oil industry, across, you know, in Baltimore, in, in um, anyone about strategic think tanks. I mean, you name it. There is no denying that the port of Baltimore is an absolutely critical strategic port and that this was a massive, you know, almost nuclear hit on our critical infrastructure. So when you see people out there en masse attacking and denying that very simple provable fact, that's also another big red flag indicator that there's more going on here. Yeah, almost immediately the Biden administration comes out in the morning. President Biden makes a mm -hmm. statement before his flight to North Carolina. We've identified nothing to see here, nothing nefarious. We are going to rebuild everything, which I don't recall them saying that about exactly. East, Pal East Palestine, Ohio, or Lahaina, yeah. or anything else, right? Mm -hmm. This is, we're going to fix it. Don't worry about it. Nothing to see here. We're going to get that port back up and running again. And then flies off. The NTSB hadn't yet investigated. They admitted two days later they hadn't even arrived on the ship yet to start their initial assessment to find out if there was any other electronic recording, then recovering the black box with two minutes of missing data from the critical moment. How can they make that assessment? How can the FBI and the White House make that assessment? And then you have cybersecurity experts on the inside in the intelligence community telling you this was a cyber attack and they're lying about this. So that's the problem is that this is the lie that's being told is that it's not a cyber attack. In the administration, for some reason, this is the the spend they put on it, but the cyber hacking community and on the inside, and then also people who investigate that are all saying it's blatantly a cyber attack. And now you have some inside people who are going to be coming forward with some testimony too late, too sorry, but it's, it's going to come at least. And this is the kind of thing we're dealing with now on a more regular basis is people are planning nefarious things against different countries and especially America, and they're executing incredible crimes against America. And we've watched this with China, and this has been reported before Congress. We've watched this with Russia. And yet our government, our current government, is not strong enough to do anything about it. They're not calling it an act of war. They're not calling these types of events that are happening uh, malicious. They're just saying, yeah, they're trying to hack us. We're going to be careful. If this was like another trade towers coming down, not just, a, not just one of our infrastructures, we would call it an act of terror. But because it's something that's an infrastructure thing, and because this administration is weak, we're calling it something we can fix tomorrow. And I don't think that shows strength. I think that shows absolute um, spinelessness. And I think it's really scary that we're being gaslit again. And we're going to see this now, just like so many other stories, Hunter Biden's laptop and so many other things. We're going to see this six months down the road, that it was an absolute cyber attack. It's already been reported behind the scenes. Now there's some groups that are being bold, bold enough to say it. And we're going to see this. Well, I want to hear what you think. Do you think it was a cyber attack based on the information that you have? Uh, do you think there's other cyber attacks coming? There's already the threats of them from our FBI, from the Department of Justice, from um, from from all kinds of people in Congress are saying that they're happening, that they're they're going to become more and more re regular. What are you doing to prepare for it? I want to hear from you below. I love the rise of both Christian and uh, entertainment and media, but also adjacent to Christianity as Christians who are using their profession to be a light. And it doesn't mean they're doing Christian projects, but they're being a light in the industry where they're at. And there's a lot of Christian actors doing this right now. There's Christian musicians, Christian athletes who are doing this. They're not in the faith-based arena, but they're using their faith behind the scenes. And also they're being bold about it to be able to share as they're doing projects. And Alan Richson is one of those who's doing that. Alan Richson is Reacher, if you haven't seen him in Reacher. He's also in a new movie, an Angel Studios movie with Hilary Swank that is an amazing movie. A year ago or so, when they were first gonna release it before all the writers strike everything else, I got to see a screener of it and I saw, I think I had like 15 minutes of it. And just the 15 minutes that I saw hooked me. So I can't wait to see it now in theaters. But he's been boldly speaking about his faith. And as a matter of fact, CBN caught up with him recently. And I want to play a clip because sometimes we hear people who thank God at the Grammys or they thank God at, if they get an Oscar or whatever, but they thank God in a very generic way. Like, oh, you know, I'm blessed, hashtag, whatever. But they don't really think and they don't really, you can't feel the substance of a relationship with God. But Alan Richardson has been sharing his whole journey through his YouTube channel, as well as interviews where he's struggled with bipolar disorder, where he struggled with some of the early being uh, sexually harassed in the industry. He shared about things about, his, about pornography. He shared things about his own struggles and his family. And as he shared those things, he shares how faith has been the difference maker in his whole life. So he's maybe not starring in Christian movies, but he's sharing these kinds of things. 
and uh, sharing in very bold ways behind the scenes as he's become a very upfront actor who I think will be probably in the DC and Marvel universe soon. He's just a phenomenal person and I really love watching him. But let's watch this clip. Hillary Swank, Alan Richson, thank you for being here. The two of you play obviously the lead roles in Ordinary Angels. There are aspects of this story that are resonating with me personally because I'm actually we're going through a lot of the these these things in my own family right now and and dealing with transplant and 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 illness and I'll say this just because we don't build this foundation. Ordinary Angels is an Angel Studios movie that's about a father who's lost his wife and he's struggling with his child's medical condition and the insurance, there's no way to get treatment because he didn't have the right insurance or something. And so uh, Hillary Swank's character becomes an advocate. She's, an, I believe, an alcoholic, she, but she jumps on it and she becomes like an Aaron Brockovich, like an advocate for this father and this child uh, so they can get medical treatment. And all that stuff. And Alan, I, I want to ask you, you've been open about about your faith and John Gunn uh, has said that this movie is really a call to action to the church. Talk a bit about that, about how maybe this movie has challenged or changed some of your own perspective on, on these issues. That's a big question. That's a big question. <laughs> I mean, look, there's a lot of polarization right now in divisiveness. And I think a lot yeah. of that sadly comes from the church which is uh, oftentimes far more focused on um, how vitriolic they can be towards one another or how they can ostracize certain groups, make out groups or monsters of others. And mm -hmm. this film rewrites the, the, the story and brings us back to the call that's placed on our lives as Christians, which is that there is a way, and that way is peace, we're called to be peacemakers. We're called to serve one another. We're called to to be cities on a hill and lights uh, to others. You know, to be the salt that flavors each other's lives. Like that. That is the call. And 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 that's what you see happening in this very broken toy that Sharon is. And I think if we spent half, um, just half the energy that we do p picking people out to go like they don't fit. They're not part of the church. They they're the enemy now. And instead, found those people um, that. Uh, are, you know, and just uh, aligned ourselves with those people that are like Sharon, who's very broken, but doing mm. the good work that Christians are called to do by just, just helping in whatever way she possibly can. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just insert some things here. Cause I've watched a lot of Alan. I've watched a lot of his YouTube videos and I've watched a lot of his interviews and he's not in any way minimizing, or he's not becoming an inclusionist in the statement of what he's saying. Like everybody's good. Everybody's whatever. He, what he's saying is that the church, there's problems like in the insurance industry, there's problems where, People are dying because uh, of corrupt systems that are in place. And instead of Christians banding together to advocate for big change, and whether it be police systems or whether it be an insurance systems or whether it be, and I love, I'm, I'm all blue. Like I believe blue. I love policemen. But there's some corruption in all places of authority right now. So in insurance companies or in foster care, whatever it is, that we have to do something. We have to band together instead of being separatists on what we disagree with. We have to come together for what we do agree with and do something about it. And so he's an advocate for that and saying that the church is really broken right now. We need to come together. So when you hear that, I want you to hear it through the right lens of how I've heard him express it a couple of times. Um, that that is that's the, that's the this this is more the picture of what Christianity is all about. This film, um, where where yeah. broken people are are receiving help and helping. Amen. Oh, that was well yeah. said. I love that because we're going to watch another video about Hillary Swank's character. I don't know if you know, this is her second faith-based movie. And she's actually talked about her faith since making these movies. So this Academy Award winning actress who's lent herself twice now to faith-based projects that are really powerful projects. I think it's notable. And I think it's something that we should watch and support. Well, let's watch the other video that they, I like this other question that was asked. Hillary, I want to go to you first and tell me what initially drew you to this story. Why did you want to be a part of Ordinary Angels? Well, it's a, certainly a story that if it was fiction, you wouldn't have believed it, one. And two, it's just a very feel-good movie and a reminder of the impact and change we can make in another's life. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have to be perfect to do it. We don't have to have all our stuff together. We can be imperfect, flawed human beings that still see another person in need and be of service and really find our purpose through that. Um, it also deals with issues of... Um, of organ transplants and how important that is and how that saves lives, um, debilitating medical debt and how there's people out there who can help with that. Um, and, um, and then the richness of what you talk about, about what Ed, you know, tell you, you share that too. It's beautiful how you talk about Ed. I mean, I obviously talk about it from Sharon's point of view, but. I love that she's sharing the significance and the meaning of why she was in this movie. And it's true because we have medical debt is the third cause of, or the second cause of bankruptcy right now in America. 
And so I don't know what it's like in other parts of the world, but their medical debt has, is destroying families. It's destroying lives. And it's causing people to not get treatment and not get greater help. And it's actually causing, costing lives. And there's some people who need to be held accountable. And I love this movie because Hillary's character, she's advocating for the medical process and she does not back down. She's a bulldog. She's not back down. She comes from this very broken background, but she's like, we're going to get this job done for this child and for this family. And I think that we do as Christians, we have to learn how to advocate. We, we have a great advocate, Jesus, and we have to learn how to advocate for people's rights and for those. And they're going to see Jesus because we advocated. They're going to become saved because we advocated, not because we sat on the sidelines and just preached. Yeah, Ed being a very r- real guy with little resources and a uh, little wherewithal to ask for help um, really mm. uh, survived these struggles in a, a very uh, remarkable way. Um, and to, to see that come to life on screen, it, it serves really as a good reminder that we all need help. We all have the capacity within us to help others. And, um, you know, I think we walk away from this film inspired and feeling like, what you know, what can I do to serve my community and those around us that are in need? So with the height of Christian movies taking over the box office the last couple of years, we've been seeing, especially the Disney effect where Disney's gone to an all time low. They went from 2019 having, I think, six movies in the box office that year that were billion dollar movies or more to having just a few wins since then and all but tons of money put into their their whole brand. And this made room for people like Angel Studios and uh, and other studios to make incredible faith based projects that have been in the big screens and have been doing an incredible job at telling real stories. And this is a real story. You don't have to be a Christian to watch the story. This story was made by faith based people. It's more faith to Jason, but it tells a real story of faith in the midst of it. And I'm seeing more and more actors. I'm seeing movie producers and musicians and just people from all backgrounds who are lending their talent because they're seeing there's something worthy. Their stories are worthy of being told. And these stories absolutely are highlighting the virtue of what it is to live um, with God's help. And I think that we need more and more of those stories you know, taking place in mainstream theaters. Can you imagine the conversation differences when you have, and we've already seen this with Sound of Freedom with human trafficking, when you have some movies that everybody's kind of shared in society and said, oh, I saw that. Oh, I didn't know about that history. I didn't know it was that deep. I didn't know it was that real. But I've had a personal experience with it through this movie. Though I couldn't be a missionary necessarily at the border and help rescue children, I saw it through this movie and it's caused me to give money or give attention to this in a way I haven't before. We're going to see this more and more through people who are making movies, writing books, creating media, we're creating media. We're going to see more and more of this as time goes on. It's going to help not only create awareness, but it's going to create awakening to cause people to go, why are they doing that? man, there's a whole group of people that call themselves Christians and they're making a big difference in society issues. They're making a big difference in areas that a lot of people didn't care about until they shine the light on it. And they're being salt to these areas. And I believe more and more of this is happening, especially with entertainment that God's going to use and harvest the entertainment industry for purposes just like this. And we're watching it happen. You're watching history being made right now, whether you whether you choose to believe it or not. There's all kinds of bad things that are happening in the entertainment industry. We're seeing exposure of the children's stuff on a level we never thought we would. Um, we ho- I hoped it would come up because it's time for, for this thing to be revealed. The hashtag Me Too movement. We're watching the evil that's been in the industry, but we're also watching God position something there that he's going to use for his glory and for his good. Oh, if you're a discerner, this, this video is for you. If you're a discerner, you're going to be going on a journey with me. Because we have to learn how to live if you're a discerner and faith and encouragement when you're discerning what's going on in the world that's going so crazy right now. How to navigate the choppy waters of discernment in a world that's lost its paddle. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time of day is for you. Oh, and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Today we're going to dive deeply into something I think is a little spicy in Christianity. <laughs> Which is living with faith and encouragement when you're blessed with the when you're blessed when you're blessed with the gift of discernment, and it seems like the world has joined a circus and you didn't audition for it. So this is a season that we're in right now, where so many hard things are happening. Again, whether it's politics, the church, maybe your local city, maybe natural disasters, whatever community, just the entertainment industry, whatever it is, there's so much crazy right now, and we got to talk about being a discerner because being a discerner. You have like high definition vision in a standard definition world. You see things other people don't see. You see the good. You see the bad. God opens your eyes to even see the downright bizarre. And it's like being able to see the Wi-Fi signals. It's like looking at everything that's going on that affects everything and everyone, but not everyone else sees it. Raise your hand if that's you. That's me! Say hashtag my turn if that's you. And let's be honest, sometimes... What we discern is more confusing than the plot twist in a soap opera. Have you ever been there when you're discerning something going, what do I do with that information? What do I do with 
I know something now spiritually. I know something in my nowhere. I know something in my beer, you know, like that. I just know what do I do? And everyone else is applauding like the emperor has new clothes, but I'm seeing him naked or in underwear. I'm like, this is, this man is not clothed. You guys are all saying this thing has so much strength to it. And yet it's not. And when you're a discerner, oftentimes though you see in high definition, your opinion about that high definition is very black and white. It's very like, this is God and this isn't God, or this is good and this isn't good. Here's a kicker. While we're busy discerning what Satan and his buddies are up to, or you know, we're, they're throwing parties we definitely don't want an invitation to, it's easy to lose perspective on where God is. And you might even be asking yourself, is this the director's cut of reality? Because I don't remember signing up for this. Again, we didn't sign up when you get discernment to see negative things. And remember, before the fall of man, discernment was still something that you would have, but you would constantly be discerning God's heart. It's one of the reasons why we do these videos is so you can learn to discern what God's doing in the midst of the crazy in the world. So what's a believer to do when they can spot a spiritual faux pas from a mile away, but they feel like they're yelling into a void? I mean, this is this happens all the time. You're a discerner. You're like, hey, guys, I see what's coming. Be careful. Let's plan. Let's do something about it. Or this is wrong. Or you're a challenger. And so people look at you as like, man, that person is so confrontational. And it's not because you're confrontational. It's because you can see that there could be a good result if we just change things. I know my wife sometimes, she's a discerner. And sometimes people call have called her like a challenger. You like to challenge processes, Sheree. <laughs> I challenge you. <laughs> You like to challenge things, don't you? And she's like, no, I don't like to challenge things. I like the opposite. I like peace. I like when everything's flowing. But if something's not flowing well and we can get to a good point, I'm going to help it flow well because I see things that maybe you're not seeing. I challenge you. And I, I'm the same way in, different, in a different way, but a discerner. And so we have to learn how to have a game plan around our discernment. And the first one. Number one. I'm number one. And not many Christians will tell you this one. This is one that I believe deeply in my own heart that you have to have a double F filter. You have to have faith and funny. You have to have humor. There's nothing funny about that. I, I mean, the ability to have the double F filter to everything. This is my own version that Shree and I do is that we have faith check, but can you find something hilariously absurd about the situation? Double check for me. Remember, you know, humor is God's way to help us digest the tough stuff. And I don't know. Like, did you hear about the guy who tried walking on water and only got his feet wet? I mean, he forgot to ask the help for the one who's actually done this before. You know, that's the whole thing is like we we sometimes look at the scriptures and we get so intense and religious and serious about it. Or we look at circumstances and we don't know how to find God and in the place of faith and even find like I look at some of the politics and I agree with and I'm like, it's laughable. <laughs> My generation, I'm going, my kids are going to look back in this like. Like we look back on smoking in the 1950s when they told people the health surgeon health general came out and said smoking was healthy for your body and would actually be a healthy habit for you to have because they're trying to figure out how to help people to manage stress. And we found out now that it, can't, it causes such severe cancer that they have to put warning labels. I'm that sur surgeon health general. I hope he I hope he paid for saying that. But at the same time, it's laughable when you watch people smoking in every movie like it was sexy and fabulous and wonderful and all the cool people do it. And now we know what it is. And I think there's a lot of issues when you look at it today and when you'll be able to look at it and go, this isn't how God made us. It's not how he's wired us. This is the enemy's plan and it's man's corruption. But God's going to do something big in the midst of this. All this stuff will be judged by the end of the age. But we're going to even see some victory and some justice on this side of eternity. Well, before we go to number two and three, I want to tell you, we have Spiritual Growth Academy. And I have a class right now. I hope you guys love this class. Come join us. Even if we're halfway through, you can still pre-watch what we've already done. And joining in right now, you can ask your questions, get prayer. If you feel like you're called to influence, if you feel like you're called to be a voice, to start a podcast, to start... Uh, write a book, to start a new business, to be an entertainer, to be in a place of influence in politics, any of those areas, if you be a pastor or to be a minister, I want to encourage you that you need to have a biblical foundation that I'm going to help you lay by going to four weeks of this class. We have incredible teaching that has a biblical premise for how to pursue influence. So you take the false humility out, that narrative of Oh, you never want to be important. You never want to be, you know, big. You never want to have a platform. You take that out because Jesus lights us to put a, a as a candle on the tallest lamp will shine from. And you put in the narrative of what's it like to walk in godly character for the influence to be about Jesus, not about yourself. And then you start to dream with God about what the place of influence you're called to is supposed to be. And I hope you guys will come join the class because we're all called to be the light of the world and the salt of the world. And we have to have an understanding of how to do that in a day of social media influencers and where there's influencers in all areas. We need to match this influence with the spirit of God and with the power that he's given you personally. And so come to the class. Hope to see you there. Okay, number two. Boom. 
on discernment when we create a playbook for it we have to have an eagle's eye view so not just the direct view we can see but we have to look from a far vantage point we have to have discernment of course at the ground level of the madness but we also have to get some altitude we have to you know eagles don't worry about the chaos on the ground because they're soaring above it we have to ask god for his eagle eye view my first ministry i ever had was called eagle's eye ministries and i was so into this because i was always a discerner i was i think i was 19. I was always a discerner and I felt like we have to have an eagle eye view on whatever God's doing because if we just have a natural view or even just a, a point blank view, we're never going to see it the way God sees it. But we have to look from a heavenly view as to how God sees the world because we're going to get impacted by compassion and empathy that we would not have had if it wasn't for climbing to the heart of God and looking again at the tragedies that are happening on the earth with his eyes. And you can do this over the smallest thing. People are being petty at work towards one of your coworkers. And you discern, like, that's jealousy. You could, you could start to go, okay, God, I just saw jealousy in this person. That's why they're being petty. What do I do now? Show me, God, what your heart is. Show me your heart for them who's being petty. Show me your heart for the person who's being discounted right now. What do I do in this circumstance? Or it could be something big about politics or about finances or about uh, an issue, a justice issue that's happening. And you're seeing something that maybe no one else is seeing. And I, I think of my friends who were, were fighting against human trafficking back in the early 90s. And they would share these facts and no one believed them. I remember even inviting one to a conference and she shared from the stage so we could take an offering for her ministry. And people just were like, I don't know if this is true. I don't know if Sean, I mean, the pastor afterwards told me, I think this person's a little into conspiracy. And now we have the proof. Now we have whole administrations have someone who's in a position over human trafficking, like in America or in Ecuador and Guatemala and so many in Thailand, there's people who are responsible for the human trafficking epidemic that's happening that has always been happening, but now we have eyes to it. And so sometimes you're going to feel alone. And when you feel alone, when you're the only person who may see an HD and everyone else is seeing normal, trust that sometimes God shows you something because he wants a friend to share his heart with and he wants someone to carry that heart. Just like in the garden, he said, won't you come and pray with me? for a while to the disciples and most of them, all of them said, no, we can't, we're sleepy now. But there's this place where I feel like sometimes when God shows me something and I'm discerning something that's really hard to look at, I feel like he's saying, let me share my heart with you because I have friends and I call you a friend. And sometimes it's enough just to go, okay, God, I, I carry this, but I have to cast it out back on you as a burden to you because it's, it's burdening my heart in a way that's not healthy for me and he takes it back. And so you have to learn how to cast your burden on God. But it's amazing how different things look when you're reminded about God's working plan the 4K resolution plan. When you're when you're seeing it from his vantage point, we're we're not we're not just watching like a trailer of a movie. We see biblically what God's doing from the beginning, from the now into the end. We can see what God's doing. That's a huge one. And then the third one is rule number three. Ignore rule number two. I mean, we have to remember this every time. Is we have a hotline to heaven, and if you're feeling overwhelmed, put the discernment line in and dial this prayer life up that you have with God. This place of equity, and you know God's. He's unlimited in his time for you. He'll always be ready to chat with you. He'll always be ready to give you advice. He's better than a coach. You know, if you feel down because you see too much, you got to focus on what God's doing. It's always good. I mean, it's a spoiler alert. God is doing a good thing. God, he's, I think one of the reasons why he's holy is because he can look at every act of evil, everything that's terrible and still be in a good mood, still be happy in who he is and his nature because he knows what he's going to do all the way through human history. He knows how he's going to resolve things. He knows what he did on the cross, and he knows how he's going to bring the fullness of that price to us. And so when you when you look at him and when you give him your heart and you give him and you trust him and you say, or you tell him, I don't know how to trust you in this process, but I choose to trust you, and you give him that place of faith, he can build in you a story that is in a place of faith that he can't build in you when you just have to know everything by intellectual knowledge. And so I think it's really profound when it gives you discernment. And a lot of times discernment comes through word pictures, comes through thoughts, it comes through prophetic activities. And I want to encourage you that if you have that knower, that's that discerner inside of you, learn to lean into your relationship with God, talk to him, read the word aloud, pray the word back to him, spend time in the word in a real way. It's going to help you so much. But the last one is I, I want to encourage you be a light. When you're a discerner, even when you're the only bulb in the chandelier sometimes, be, become the one who discerns and and, and become the one who, who who brings light to what you're discerning in the dark room. Don't just be like someone who repeats the darkness. I see the darkness, but be somebody who's like, hey, in the light, I can see things are going on, but I have hope for us that as we get brighter and brighter, we're going to clean this all out. And so even the smallest light makes a huge difference. We've seen that over and over. It's not a cliche. You're not just a light. You're like a disco ball. You really are. You're going to reflect God's love in a million directions. So you have to strap on your spiritual goggles and keep your faith right front and center. And you got to remember that when the world's 
competing in the how crazy can it get Olympics, which is happening right now. There's a God who's not only the judge, but also the coach. And again, spoiler alert, he wins. And his team's going to win. And you want to be on the winning team. And when you when you understand that, when you understand, like, I'm on the winning team, then you're not feeling the loss the same way when you see the evil, when you see the darkness, when you see man's intention, when you see the affair, when you see all the stuff that's happening in the world around you, you go, you know what, God's still winning. And so though this is painful to see, it's painful to look at, it's painful to see what the strategy of the enemy is, it's painful to see the weapons being formed, but understand they're being formed, but they won't prosper, it takes God. It takes God to say, okay, God, but you're going to break those weapons down before they start to stab, before they start to shoot. You're going to break those things down. So we're going to walk through this world with a discernment that's dialed up into faith, that's fueled up that by our complete relationship with God, and hopefully with humor that's fully charged. <laughs> because at the end of the day, God's going to get us through this, and he's going to get you through so many things that you're going to help other people also get through the darkest nights of their soul. So I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to pray for you. If you're a discerner, if you're married to a discerner, if your friends are a discerner, I pray right now, God, that you give us a higher capacity to discern first what's in your heart. And if we see something, that we'd immediately go to you and that we would see your heart, your vision, your desire, your, your plan that's already being enacted. And God, we want to know you. We want to know you in such a way that when we see what's happening in politics, when we see what's happening in the dark world, when we see what's happening in places that we don't want to look at anymore, that we know that you're looking first and that you're guiding your eyes for a moment to share in your burden because you're a good father and you never turn your eyes away from evil, but you resolve it. You already have a plan. You have a, such a perfect plan to resolve this. And we're so grateful, God, that we get to be a part sometimes of that plan. And other times we get to be a part of the prayer towards the resolution and the justice from coming. And I'm reminded of slavery in America and how for that long period of time, there were slaves that were praying with a dream that their sons and daughters would be free. And we now have that generation where the sons and daughters of slavery are free. But there's a generation that discerned the evil of slavery. Then they began to pray against it. And they began to shut it down the spirit first. And then in a natural, the civil war happened. And they became, became advocates of all races, especially in the white race, towards ending slavery. And white and black people have come further and further together along with other races because discernment was at play. Because people like Martin Luther King stood up with discernment and said, I have a dream and gave us a dream that came from seeing the evil and the depths and the bowels of the awful racism. And he looked at it and said, but there's a God dream to have. What is the God dream? We have to be that kind of people. We have to look at this with God's eyes. So as I pray for you, I pray that God would open your eyes to HD, that he would give you even more of a gift of his heart, even more than the gift of discernment. Now it's time for news you need to know. And I love this first news story. It's all about near-death experiences. I don't know if you know this, but for over three decades, John Burke has studied thousands of near-death experiences, NDEs, and he was involved with Angel Studios' recent projects on near-death experiences. And he's discovered a striking commonality. He's in the most extensive research of anybody in, in our time. And the commonality of all of them, that every individual, regardless of religious background experience, the God of the Bible. He said, I interviewed 70 people on every continent, and they found that they all encountered the same God. It didn't matter their culture or ethnicity or religious background, but he said, God's a God of all nations, and this is his conviction. He personally had a near-death experience, too, that's very interesting to listen to, and he told us recently to the Christian Post. Also, we now have assisted killing being a thing for mental illness, where there's a news story where the Christian Post also covered this and other groups are covering this, but there's a young woman who's going to take her life by assisted suicide because she doesn't want to live anymore. This is becoming a thing in Canada. It's becoming a thing in America where you can take a, a life of somebody and you can look at it as compassion or mercy when they're struggling with mental illness, when instead we should be looking at our mental health field, our psychiatrists, psychologists, and also counselors. Now, again, I don't villainize this woman because she's in so much emotional pain. I can't imagine the pain she's living with, but I do villainize our society for allowing us to come to the point where we can just deal with, I mean, think about 70,000 homeless on the streets of California. If they can follow this logic all the way down the road a little ways, we're going to start to euthanize people because they're mentally ill. And that is not human. That's not what we were made for. So I thought it was an important story to bring up. The North Face is experiencing pressure for all they're supporting, this time for child abuse, 
When an overnight youth camp encouraged 12 year olds to dance provocatively as drag queens, the North Face didn't make any comment about this except for they were proud of their sponsorship. Again, is it time to ban North Face? I don't know. Well, this is the end of the show. Thank you so much for watching today. I hope that the show has meant something to you. I hope it's moved you forward in your faith for what's happening this week. And let's be praying into the world events that we're seeing. Whenever you get struck by something and it hits you wrong, make sure to bring it to prayer. Make sure to discern it with God. He's going to give you a, an insight on it, you know, clarity on it that's going to really help you. And we're going to be talking about popular culture events, cultural events, political events, and things that are happening through disasters that are happening all through the world with a God discernment that only Christianity brings us to. And I'm so encouraged that you watch or listen to us today. Make sure to leave a review if you're watching or listening to this by podcast. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe and hit notifications. We'll see you next time. <laughs>